in homicide investigations, you can't have tunnel vision. That's what I learnt when I investigated the death of security guard Slavik Tomsek. We were heading in one direction, all the leads were pointing us in one direction, but we were wrong. You've got to let the evidence speak for itself. Don't make the facts fit your theory. front seat which was badly burned. We don't know whether he's been shot, we don't know whether he's been stabbed. It's a horrific act and any death is tragic. Total of nine shots were fired. The best detectives Victoria's ever seen. I don't intend to stop until someone's brought to justice. Failure is not an option. February uh, 2002, and I, I was at home, sound asleep. I think the phone rang at about 2 a.m. Basically, when that phone goes off, there's not going to be good news at the end. Probably 95% of the time, you've been told that someone uh, has been shot, someone has been stabbed, and then it's about preparing to go out. But have a shower, dress up in your suit. I was told that a security guard had been found at the back of Casablanca's reception centre out at uh, Cranbourne. From what I'm told, he's bashed and his hands are tied behind his back. And then you start to visualise in your head, I wonder what this scene will look like. We drive out and uh, we arrive at Cranbourne at Casablanca's reception centre. We've arrived at about quarter past three. Then you go through the process. The first thing you've got to do at a crime scene, make sure that it's secured, make sure that it's guarded. Then it's an examination of the scene. Towards the back of the building is a car park. And you can see drag marks. Then you can see a large pool of blood. Then not far from that is a high wooden fence and some rubbish bins. Then we walked around to where the rubbish bins were. And you see Mr Tomsek and he's lying face down. His hands are tied behind his back, but up to his feet, so he's hogtied. He's deceased, there's blunt trauma to the head. This person has been bashed. We never recovered a weapon, but we do know that from the injuries, it's consistent with an iron bar. So the initial briefing is, Mr Tomsek is a security guard and his role is to go around and check commercial premises. His security van is missing, so the killer or killers might have stolen it. His boss, Sandy Semple, was there and we had a discussion with him. It was really nothing new that night at all. It was just a standard night. I told Slavik at the outset that it was a dangerous job doing security, that it was risky, that he had to be careful all the time. He had to be on his toes all the time. He 
He rang me at 10 o'clock thereabouts and said, Sandy, somebody make trouble for us. They cut my tire. Sandy says to him, well, can you fix it? He says, yes, I'll fix it. And that was the last I heard from him. And then about one o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from one of the clients on his run saying that nobody has been to pick up the cash to put in the bank. So then I went looking for Slavic and I went down his run all the way to all the clients. And that's when the horror started, when I got to Casablanca. I noticed what looked like a pool of oil on the road. I stopped. I looked at the oil on the road and I thought, that's not oil. And I took a sniff and it smelt like burnt copper, which is blood. And I thought, no, no. I thought, what the hell? I searched the whole garden in case he'd crawled somewhere because he was hurt. He's got his torch and he's walking around shining his torch. And he goes to where the rubbish bins are. And then I found him. But wasn't a lot I could do. <sighs> Sandy wasn't coping very well. Like, um, to some extent, I think it was as if he sort of blamed himself. He was part of the team. He was part of my team, you know? And I was responsible for him. And I suffer for that. So it's about then photographing the scene and start to examine it. Right at the front gate, in amongst some bushes, you can see that the bushes have been trodden down. It gives the appearance that someone has been hiding within this small group of bushes. On the driveway is a bolt. It's about three and a half inches long. It's got a piece of weld at the bottom, but it's pointed. Doesn't mean much, but it just seems it's odd or it's foreign to the scene. Also in the car park where the pool of blood is, there is a long piece of bougainvillea. Now, in the driveway, there is a bougainvillea plant, and we can see where it's broken. Mr Tomsek, in his hand, has a couple of spikes. So the bougainvillea looks like, at some stage, he might have grabbed hold of it. The body is visually examined. Between his fingers was the tip of a rubber glove. Now, that would appear that, at some stage, he's grabbed hold of whoever's responsible. They must have been wearing, like, a rubber glove, and the tip of the glove has come off. Now, we know that in that tip of the glove is Mr Tomsek's DNA. It's mixed with another person. So what we have is 
partial DNA of the offender in the tip of the glove. When he is found near the wooden gate, he's bound with nylon cord, it's blue, and he's hogtied. That rope looks new. Question is, did someone go off and buy some rope, because you can buy that in any service station, or did they have it with them? When you go to a crime scene, you've got to go there with an open mind. Don't go there with a preconceived idea about what you think's happened. You've got to let the facts speak for themselves. The facts are the evidence. Don't have a theory and then try to make the facts fit the theory. If you do that, you will go down the wrong path. My next step is to work out why this has happened. You start to look at his background. What is in Mr Tomsek's background that would warrant this? Slavik came from Poland, but he didn't have a lot of money. He came here hat in hand and he needed a job because he it was just before Christmas. He was honest. He did his job properly. He could be depended on 100%. Honestly, I don't think he had an enemy in the world. He has no criminal history. There is nothing in his background or profile which would warrant his death. At about quarter past six in the morning, it's already hit the media that there's been a possible homicide at Casablanca's. Police are appealing for anyone with information to come forward. It's been a very, very vicious attack. Uh, cold, calculating and very cruel. Then we get a phone call at about seven o'clock. Someone rang the Cranbourne police station and said, I understand that there's been a security guard killed. I want to tell you who's responsible. It's February 2002. Security guard Slavik Tomsek has been bashed to death in the middle of the night. I've been at the crime scene since about three o'clock in the morning. At about seven, I get an anonymous phone call. It's a tip off about the killer. Someone rang the Cranbourne police station and said, I want to tell you who's responsible. And they said that that person is currently at the Cranbourne tip He's disposing of some bloody clothing. So immediately we make arrangements for the uniformed police from Cranbourne to go to the tip. The man says, well, I'm down here to see somebody who works here. The question is asked, where were you last night? He says, I was at home with my girlfriend. That's where it's left. And the man goes on his way. We put out a media appeal that anyone who's seen Slavik's missing van, please ring in. We got a phone call to say, the vehicle is parked on the side of Thompson's Road, Cranbourne. This is about four kilometres from Casablanca's. We arranged for a detective to go down there because that becomes what we call a secondary crime scene. Is there some evidence within that vehicle? On each side of the road, for about 300 metres, there are items which have been thrown out of the vehicle. So we have a set of keys. We have a driver's licence. Why would you throw items out of both sides of the vehicle? Now, when we look at the vehicle on the passenger side, there is blood splatter around the wheel arch. 
but the wheel arch is also bent. So it looks like at the time Mr Tomsek was changing the wheel, more likely he's been attacked because we have blood splatter around the wheel arch and it looks like the jack has slipped and that's what's damaged the wheel arch. Now, when we look in the back of the car, there is a tyre which has a puncher. It's got four deliberate holes in it. They are about two inches, two inches, so they're all equal. We then think, well, what's the bolt that we found in the driveway? Now, it's got a piece of weld and it's got a sharpened point. What we think is someone has made up a plate a metal plate about two inches by two inches and welded four bolts on it, which have been sharpened. And it's been hammered in to the tire. So this is not a puncher. This is a deliberate act whilst Slavik is out walking around Casablanca's so that when he gets back, he can't move his vehicle. Then you start, well, why would someone do that? I believe that it's not a case of just someone coming along and uh, an opportunist. I think there's uh, been some preparation to that. Media appeals are very important in an investigation. But I don't always release every piece of information. If someone comes forward and tells you something and that information has never, ever been released before, you either know that they're involved in the crime or they know someone who is involved in the crime. I believe that, that he has been targeted rather than uh, the premises. A man comes forward. He says, I was walking my dog through Casablanca's. I saw Mr Tomsek. He was bending down. He was just about ready to pull the wheel off. And I said to him, do you want a hand, mate? And he says, no, I'll be all right. Well, it has to be within about 15 to 30 seconds of that, he was attacked. So, of course, we're going to look at that man walking the dog. Sometimes the actual offender will inject himself into the investigation because they think in their own mind, you know what? What about if someone saw me walking the dog, right, and I'm actually the killer, if I go forward and say, I spoke to him, I was walking the dog, I'm actually putting myself there, I'm saying that I spoke to him, but I didn't kill him. Then it becomes very hard to disprove that sometimes. Then we talk to him and he says, well, from there, I went up to near the RSL. We're actually able to get some video footage which confirms that he is at the RSL with his dog at around 11.30 and he's there for some time. So we're more than satisfied that it's not him. But who is involved in this death? We know from the scene someone is hiding there. Is it one person? Is it two people? They've gone there solely to actually puncture the tyre. As he's just about to pull the tyre off, he talks to the man who's walking his dog, and then within a short time after that, can't be very long, he's viciously attacked. Slavik was a, quite a gentle soul, apparently, who was very close to his mother. Slav Tomsik's distraught family say they've been struggling for answers since his death last week. He was quiet, kind, gentle and caring man.
We don't believe he had any enemies. You could not even have an argument with him. His mother was an old European lady who spoke very broken English, so it would have been terrible for her to have lost her son in these circumstances and to have to go and force herself to make a public appeal in front of lights and cameras and the whole catastrophe. Beyond belief. You know, I've, I've investigated over 320 homicides and sometimes man's inhumanity to man is something that I just can't explain. Animals wouldn't do something to another animal. This was a horrific death for whatever reason. They went there with the intention of immobilising the vehicle. They went there with the intention of then attacking Mr Tomsek at his most vulnerable moment when he is down and he's hit from behind. Why? Is the motive theft? No, it's not. We've recovered the car. We've recovered his wallet. There's no money taken out of his wallet. Is it a case of mistaken identity? See, Mr Tomsek didn't normally do that route. There was a retired policeman and he used to do Casablancas. So you ask yourself, could there be anything in his background which would warrant being attacked? He's married, he doesn't have a criminal history, but we do know that he has a bit of a gambling habit. Could he have borrowed money to play the poker machines? But in the end, when we go through that and we actually talk to him, we look at his financials and all that, we can't find anything in his background which would warrant an attack. We've got a lot of information coming in. We're looking at all those, and this takes probably maybe three or four weeks. And then I received a phone call. I received a phone call from a detective at Cranbourne and he said, a witness has come forward who works in a car yard. He said, I'm standing behind a car doing some work and I hear a conversation. A man says, we bashed him, we tied him up. And the other man says, well, what happened about the bolt? And he goes, oh shit. One bolt came off and the jacks have got the bolt. What they're referring to is the police have got the bolt and we did have the bolt. No one knew of the existence of the bolt being left there other than the investigators and the crime scene people. We hadn't released that to the media. This was something that was very, very specific. Well, it was quite clear that the information that he provided about the bolt could only come from the killer. We'd been working on the Tomsick murder for nearly a month. There was no motive and we had very few leads until a car salesman came forward with a very interesting story. He was working at the car yard about one week after the murder on a Saturday. The salesman says he saw a skinny man get out of a green Mitsubishi van and start chatting to another bloke. The skinny man says, we bashed him, we tied him up and we left him at the back of the reception centre. And he goes, one bolt came off and the jacks have got the bolt. The information about the bolt could only come from the killer. The car yard salesman knows that they're talking about the murder of the security guard. He says, I get up and I go into my office. And the man in the green van, this is according to the witness, comes in and says, I want to drive that white statesman there. 
So he says, I take him, I let him drive, and we drive for a short time, and then we come back to the car yard. So we think, ha, huh, we've now got a really good lead. The car salesman then says, about two weeks later, on the 18th of March, the same skinny bloke comes back to the car yard in the same green van, and he wants to test drive the white statesman. The car salesman said, you can take it, but you must produce your driver's licence. So he said he did, he produced his driver's licence. Peter Samuel Smith of an address in Cranbourne. So now we have what we think is a pretty good suspect, Peter Samuel Smith. Then you start to look at his background. He was someone known to police. Now, Peter Smith, in his own words, is no angel. He's a man who's got a little bit of um, experience of, of being questioned by police over various matters. Uh, he could be a scallywag, as we say. So we arrange some surveillance. In other words, we have a crew of people who actually follow Peter Smith. We have some video footage of him getting some petrol at a service station. We show it to the witness, the car salesman, to make sure you've got the right person. He says, that is the man who came and drove the statesman. That is the man who gave me the licence of Peter Samuel Smith. We build it up to the point where we have sufficient to execute a warrant on the house. We arrive there, it's a unit, it's like a duplex, but what's out the front of his house? A green Mitsubishi L300 van. This is really looking good. We've now got the van, we've got Peter Samuel Smith. About to head off to work and I got a knock on the door. I thought, that's a police knock. <laughs> Open the door and there stands Ron. We tell him what we're there for. He says, I don't know, I can't help you. I know nothing about it. So we search the house. In the lounge room in a drawer is a brand new roll of blue nylon rope. It's identical to, I think, the blue nylon rope Mr Tomsek is tied up with. So the case is not bad now because I've got an eyewitness. I've got the van which corroborates the car salesman. I've now got blue rope, which I think is identical. Got to take St Kilda Road. And spent the rest of the day being interviewed. And he says, I'll help you out, I'll, I'll talk to you. So we talk to him and he says, I've only ever been to the car yard once. Oh no, you went there twice. He says, no, I only ever went to that car yard once and I can prove it. Well, Peter, how could you prove that? He said, I wrote it in my diary. I've, I've always kept the diary, I don't know. It's something I do. I knew I had it written in my diary the day I'd gone and test drove the car. Because I wrote it down in my diary what he wanted for it. That was one thing I remembered. So I still have police searching the house. So I say, can you find his diary? And they find his diary. His diary shows on the 18th of March, he's got test drove white statesman from a particular car yard in Cranbourne, drove down to friend's house in Mornington. He says, that is the only day that I went to the car yard. I think, well, that's odd.
So I ring the car out and I speak to the car salesman. He says, yeah, I've got a book here that people sign out. So I said, can you send me the book? He says, well, I'll photo stat the page and I'll send that. And he sends it in. And it's marked 2nd of March, Holden Statesman, 18th of March, again the White Statesman, and the name Peter Smith. So it looks like on two occasions Peter Smith has been there. I'll put that to Peter Smith and say, well, you've been identified. This is you and you've been there twice. He says, absolutely not. At the end of the process, I look at it and make an assessment. Do we have sufficient evidence to charge him? I have an eyewitness. I have something from the crime scene that no one knows about, but Peter Smith has been apparently talking about. So I make the assessment, there's sufficient evidence to charge him. So I say, Peter, I've got to tell you that you're going to be charged with the murder of Mr. Tom Sick. Well, did he let fly? I did not do it. Ron, I've been here all day. I've been helping you out. I've told you I've only been to the car yard once and it was the 18th of March. What are you doing to me? But Peter, there's sufficient to charge you. I did not do it. I was going off ahead. Didn't know what to think. We read my rights. Do you understand? I said, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? We're at nearly 14 hours. He stopped and started a few times. Yeah. I think it's some 427 questions. I put it to you, I put it to you, and in the end I said, mate, I put it to you. Is it, you know, you're a bit fucked up in the head, mate. What are you talking about? <laughs> When you tell somebody you're going to be charged with murder, if they've actually done it, you get no reaction. If I say to someone, you're going to be charged with murder and you haven't done it, straight away there's this massive reaction. What does Peter Smith say? I did not do it. I've been here all day. I've been helping you. Peter, the evidence is that you've done it. He uh, suspended the interview. Come back in about half an hour later and said, I'm now formally charging you with the murder of Salmar Tomsic, remanding you in custody, blah, 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 blah. And I just sat there and shook my head in disbelief. I start to think something's not right. Four months after the murder of security guard Slavik Tomsek, I'd just charged Peter Smith with his murder. But something wasn't right. Peter was continuing to protest his innocence. I said, well, let's come to a deal, and I shook his hand. And I said, if you are committed for trial, and I find that there's some issue with some of the evidence, I will re-look at it. So he's remanded and he stays in custody for about six to seven months whilst we prepare all the evidence. I get the report back from Forensic Science, which says the blue nylon rope from Peter Smith's house is nearly identical to the blue nylon rope which Mr Tomsek has been tied up with. But it's twisted a different way. In other words, it is not the same rope. So whilst I think I have a great piece of evidence, in the end, I don't. In Mr Tom Seek's finger, between his fingers, was the tip of a rubber glove. So what we have is partial DNA of the offender in the tip of the glove. So the DNA was tested. We compared that with DNA from Peter Smith 
and it didn't match. The key to this investigation was that there was an eyewitness. The eyewitness says, I saw Peter Smith on the 2nd of March at the car yard. He was talking about a bolt and about bashing a security guard. I needed to look at the car sign out book because I'd only ever seen a fax photocopy of it. I went to Cranbourne and I got the original book and I looked at it. And I went, oh, someone's changed this. Someone has changed it to make it look like Peter Smith took the car on the 2nd and the 18th. So I have to get that analysed. And a handwriting expert looks at the book and says, I can tell you that was changed and altered on the 2nd. And on the 18th, whoever changed it is the same person. I believed at that point that my witness had changed the document in the book that he changed it to support the story that he told me that Peter was there on the 2nd and Peter was there on the 18th. I then started to, to doubt the veracity of my witness. Now, this witness also says that Peter Smith drove a green van when he was there on the 2nd of March. I then went and spoke to Peter Smith's neighbour he says, the first day I saw the van was the 18th of March. I have never seen it at his house prior to that. Then I think, well, how could he have had the van on the 2nd of March? And then I think, could the salesperson be actually the killer? He's not telling me the truth. Why? So we obtained the car salesman's DNA and that didn't match the DNA of the offender in the tip of the glove. We also were able to verify that on the night of the murder, he was home with his children. So we were satisfied he wasn't involved, but he did overhear that conversation about the bolt. I've got many sayings. One is, beware of the witness whose memory improves with the passage of time. This witness believed that Peter Smith test drove the white statesman and was at the car yard on two occasions. But he was wrong. He made an honest mistake. But once he was committed, he didn't want to embarrass himself and tell the investigators, so he continued on that path to change the facts to fit his theory, but his theory was wrong. It then created for me a fair amount of stress because ultimately Peter got committed. You know, this was Ron Idle's case, and he is a remarkable detective because uh, not only he's very good at what he does, which is catch the bad guys, he's very inclined to want to catch only the bad guys and not just to put a line through unsolved crimes. And it's, some would say that some police are a bit inclined to want to get results, but Ron is very inclined to want to get the correct result. I go to Paul Coglin, the Director of Public Prosecutions, and I said to him, yes, we could run a trial, but I think it would be a miscarriage of justice. I had the responsibility, ultimately, with advice from others of making the decision about whether the case would proceed. Ron said, you know, we've got someone committed for trial, but I don't now think that the witness who's giving the evidence against this man is correct. You're dealing with a homicide squad detective who's got 25 years' experience. If you've got someone like Ron with serious doubts, then you don't go on with the case. It didn't actually mean you couldn't have run that case. Let a jury decide whether or not it was correct, but Ron wouldn't take that view of it. So we made a decision to withdraw the charge. My barrister comes to me in the dock and he goes to me, he winked at me, he goes, you're going home today. I says, you're shooting me. He goes, you're going home today, mate. So Peter Smith was released. 
but that meant that there had to be a full inquest. The coroner's court, to me, it's a solemn place. This is where the coroner makes a decision about someone's loved one. That time of coming in here for the Tomsek inquest and standing in the witness box was a fairly emotional time for me. My heart is pumping. Peter Smith is sitting there. Peter Smith doesn't know what I'm going to say. I have to make an admission publicly that we got it wrong. It's something that weighed on my conscience. I got to the point of saying, Peter Smith is not responsible. And I couldn't go any further. I broke down. It was like this massive weight off my shoulder. And the coroner, Mr White, said, Ron, hop out of the box. Get yourself together and we'll come back and we will um, continue on. In the end, I proved that Peter was innocent. When the coroner, Peter White, said that I'd acted in the best interests uh, of Victoria Police Force, uh, I thought that was reasonably special words. He got exonerated on that day. Five years later, that was a good day. Mm. That was a good day. Outside the court, I reach out to Peter and I say, I want to wish you all the best. It was a funny moment. Yeah, I shook his hand. Had a bit of a giggle at each other and said, yeah. At least he had the balls to look me in the eye and apologise. And he says, we're square. He said, Ron, I've done 11 months. I've done some bad things which I haven't got caught for, so let's get on with our life, and we walked away. But this case goes on. It's an unsolved investigation, and I always say, the answer's in the file. The very first piece of information we got related to a man at the Cranburn tip, several years later, I was doing a different inquiry, and I went and saw a young lady who was living in Cranburn. She was the partner of Craig Dullard. Now, it is Craig Dullard who is the man for the Cranburn tip at seven o'clock on the morning of the murder. At the time, the anonymous phone call said, Craig Dullard is responsible for the death of the security guard. He's currently at the tip now, getting rid of some bloody clothing. Craig said to the police, I was home with my girlfriend last night. That's the bit that's not followed up. That's accepted and Craig Dallard goes on his way. But I said to his girlfriend, well, now that I'm here, do you remember the murder of the security guard? She says, yes. I said, was Craig home that night? She said, no. He didn't get home till nine o'clock in the morning. At the time, I am told, don't worry about Craig. He's been eliminated. It's all good. Bad mistake. That part should have been followed up, but at the end, it wasn't. As the senior sergeant, I have to take responsibility for that. But from that point on, he is not alibied for the murder of Tom Sek and I have a view that he is responsible for Tomsek's murder. Why would he kill Slavic Tomsek? We discovered that Craig Dullard had a violent history. 
He'd already been implicated in another murder. So I start a process to look at that, and then I get a phone call from a detective at Frankston, and he said, well, I've got to tell you, Craig Dullard, he's died from sugar diabetes or something, but he died of natural causes. My main suspect now has passed on, and it's very difficult other than you could reopen the inquest, but sometimes you accept that and you move on. I think at least we found an answer for Slavic's family. Peter Smith would have an absolute right to be angry. But in the end, I honoured my agreement to re-look at the evidence, and to that he is thankful. Ron's all right. Basically, he's done the right thing in the end, you know? Done the right thing by me in the end. So, I learned a lot out of that job. No, I Sweet. did. Yeah. No, I did. It says a lot about Ron that one of the cases he values the most is somebody who he thought you had to let go. I knew that you had an inkling that I didn't do it. I think you're right. After I've interviewed someone and charged someone, I always say if there's a very, very strong reaction about being charged, then that person hasn't done it. In all the times of interviewing people, you're the only one that's been charged that's given that reaction. Mm. For Ron to have been unwittingly involved in successfully prosecuting an innocent man would have devastated him. If he hadn't had the brains and the morality to actually second guess himself and go back and look at the case again, perhaps no one would have ever known. Perhaps this innocent man would have been convicted. <laughs> Jail's a shitty place. <laughs> Not somewhere I ever want to go again anyway, put it that way. So yeah, life's pretty bloody good. Life's pretty good. An investigation is a search for the truth. I had sufficient evidence and I acted in good faith when I charged Peter Smith. When I realised that there was a doubt, I searched for the truth. I could have sat back and said, just let this be a matter for the jury. But I could never have lived with myself if for some reason he had been convicted. <laughs> <laughs>